Hello there, mates. Misha Gaming here. Thank you for checking into this next episode of Bella Donna's. Let's jump right back into it, shall we? So, uh, today, I think that the mouse is going to be working just fine. Uh, no, I, I might have spoke too soon. But it's not as glitchy as it was like yesterday. Not yesterday, but whatever it was I recorded this last. I don't think we'll have as much problems with it as we did before. A stuffed raven atop a bust of Pallas Athena. What a cheerful decoration. Let's call them Annabelle and Dupin. How, how is that cheerful? That's a lot of books. Imagine you had books filled with every possible combination of letters. I wonder how much room they would take. There's a finite amount of letters, but unless we acknowledge a maximum length of a word, there would still be an infinite number of combinations, and the library would have to be infinitely large. Oh, uh, why were we pondering that? So I have not quite been able to decide if this is Anna, what is her name, Belladonna, <laughs> or like who she Look, is. A perfect sphere. Let's see if I can get two parallel lines to intersect. That is not a perfect sphere. That's like a what do they call it? Just the shape of the Earth. It's like kind of fat towards the middle. Not a sphere. The doctor's handwriting. I know it well by now. Alright, let's get into it. <clears throat> Months have passed, and I must indeed conclude that the procedure was a success. The new Belladonna is certainly calmer, friendlier, and more docile. She gladly keeps me company in the laboratory nowadays, and she is polite and pleasant in everything she does. One is tempted to describe her demeanor as lobomatized, but no. When I ask her questions, she will answer in a clear and articulated voice, and she is responsive to all kinds of stimuli. Merely, I've gotten all I could ask for. That troublesome maid is gone and Belladonna is back with me, compliant as ever. Her behavior ex is exemplary. exemplary? Yeah, that's the word. Our lives are returning to the idyllic past I had thought lost in all aspects except one. No child giggles in these halls, but my research is proceeding rapidly and the question presents itself. Who needs a womb to create life? I have made an unexpected observation, a side effect of the unliving condition. The household cat, a black beast and once Belladonna's loving pet, have gained a great di distrust, mistrust for her, the latter's new form. A disquiet has fallen over the animal and he will not go near the creation. Why is this, I wonder? Why does lack of trust, this sudden and ferocious hatred? Belladonna's appearance seems to me not much unlike what the cat before so fondly gravitated towards, but evidently the beast perceives a difference. As a species, the cat has popularly been associated with witchcraft and my my mysticism. Their eyes do indeed strike one as remarkable. It is perchance so that the feline oculus is capable of peering into a human soul and spirit, and so when faced with the creative Belladonna is stressed by the lack thereof. The man will kill his wife. Well, uh, he's dead now, so obviously he got his just desserts. I should sit down and write a story. But with all these journals and diary pages lying around, it seems like I already may have. I'd say. Look at this portrait. Another portrait. It says her name is Francisca Canosa, an old relative, no doubt. But I wonder how she relates to the Von Trauerschloss family. Me and you both, sister. Let's go to this ladder. I'm not going near that horrible cat. I'll have to get rid of it somehow if I want to proceed. Uh, let's see. I don't think I have anything here that will, uh, aid me in that. Maybe I'll take the- Alright, okay. Oh, okay. I'll have to get rid Okay, okay. We're not going near the horrible cat. I have to get rid of it to proceed. So, I'm guessing we'll need to come back to this room. And, uh, was there anything I could do with his body? I kind of, like, left it in a hurry last time. Well, not much of a hurry, just kind of in disinterest. Uh, the body is still warm. He cannot have been dead for much longer than I have been alive. Did he have to die for me to live? I don't know. Oh, there's the candlestick. The candlestick. And it seems to be the murder weapon. Alright, let me just tamper There's with something this in his evidence. Pocket. It's a small, delicate key. He kept it in the pocket closest to his heart. I wonder what it unlocks. But seeing as he's crazy, I doubt it's his heart that it unlocks. Blood is flowing from a wound in his skull. I wonder and we're back! Sorry about that, my computer accidentally closed the, uh... Well, not accidentally, I'm pretty sure it was on purpose, but it closed the game. That's what happened. Uh, hand. These are the hands that give life. Talk about meeting your maker. Oh, 
also, if she is aware that she is dead, question mark? Or has she not figured that one out yet? Uh, the wound. Mark, his head has been cracked open by a heavy blow. He couldn't have seen the attack coming. He was dead before he knew what happened. So, he trusted his assailant then? Was it me? I have no memories from my life before. Maybe it was I who killed him. But then, how was I brought back? Oh, so I guess she does know that she's dead. Hmm. Let's go put the, the candlestick back and uh, see if that does anything. I'm not sure that it's real, but pretty back, pretty back, can I put it back? No, okay. No. I don't know why I thought that would work. I don't know why I thought that would work. It's a mortar and a pestle. They seem can you to get it now? Okay. All right, I guess we don't need it then. Let's go to the living room. Why not? Oh wait, let me see if I really couldn't go into the backyard earlier. Oh, I could. Let's do the living room first. Just because it's, it's already here. Ooh, a journal page and blood. Page. This one has drops of blood on it. Uh -huh. I, Belladonna, must think, remember, Hands, fingers, right wards. I don't know that where it says hate. All right. Uh, that was a uh, very interesting. This room looks completely abandoned. I suppose this is what happens when you're down to a skeleton crew of only one maid, no matter how fantastic she is. Yeah, and you don't remember. Don't forget the maid it's got off. It's outside. I have no concept of the current year, season, or even geographical location. Yo, oh, Belladonna, I... If that is your real name, why you gotta be... Why you gotta be so monotone? I don't see anything else in here, so let's get back out to the hall. Now we can go outside. That's pretty much our only option that is left. Alright, tombstones. Oh, there's a there's a thingy. Okay. This must be the family cemetery. Yet baby Lucas rests in an urn in the dining room. Why is that? Why is that? That is odd. Let's read this journal page. One more Belladonna letter. Oh, from Let's Belladonna. Read this Clara figure. Clara Stever was one of the several chambermaids we hired when we moved into the castle shortly after the marriage. In the warm light of recent events, I feel, I feel as though I could pick her out of a crowd already at this time, but I suspect that the truth is that she was just another servant, one of many, and I didn't pay her close to the attention I now know she deserves. The time following the death of Lucas is hazy and unclear in my memory. I know I spent most of my time in an armchair in the living room, staring out the window. I now know that this must have been a difficult time for the staff as well. My apathy left them without purpose, as more and more of the household was shut down. Soon the cooks and stable grooms began abandoning what they wisely identified as a sinking ship. As more and more of the staff left the castle to seek employment elsewhere, there was less and less reason for the rest to stay, and the household was quickly decimated. But throughout all of this, young Clara never left my side, and she gradually shouldered more and more the household responsibilities, making it her task to take care of me and nurse me through my melancholy. It was her loyalty and industriousness, which, when, which, when everyone else left, that finally brought me back from my condition. And, indeed, her love. As I now sit down to write, it has been a long, unbroken chain of happy days. Claire and I have the whole castle practically to ourselves and nothing to do but to enjoy our lives with each other. We sleep in a new room every night, cook our own food, and have picnics on our tables or in front of the fireplace. We have no incentive whatsoever to uphold convention and norms when this house has become like a secure pocket inside Earth's of reality. In truth, the touches, this touches on what I treasure most in Claire. Neither of us reap any concrete benefits from our union, neither financial nor societal. There is no embedded purpose of producing heirs. Our relationship is just solely for itself, and it is its own reward. I'm already adopting her adorable habit of naming inanimate objects. The castle is not quite ours, however. Wolfram still lurks like a ghoul downstairs, and occasionally emerges and spends a night up here with me. 
We have little in common anymore. In fact, he is like a completely new person. His mind is vacant, his stare distant, he's thinner than ever before and shivers like with cold. Claire jokingly suggested that we might have him declare mad and send him out to an institution. An innocent idea in her mind, but with some planning, this act might eventually prove to be our surest path to finally reclaim the old castle for us alone. Oh, so the crazy man was right. He was, she was cheating on him. I don't, honestly, I don't blame Belladonna. He's seen. milk out here. I wonder how long it's been here. At any rate, it's frozen completely solid. No wonder in this cold. He seemed pretty uh, out there. It says Snowflake the pet cat. How cute. Okay. The stone is so old and the name is worn off. What the heck? A note. Great God, why did I not then expire? Why well, am I here to relate the destruction of the best hope and the purest creature of Earth? It was mere days ago, at the, bleak of our, at the peak of our bliss when Clara fell ill. She complained of headaches and tiredness, so I made a bed for her and laid her down to rest. For the next few days, I cared for my companion just as she had cared for me and nursed her with all my love and compassion. We believed it was just a passing sickness and that it would be over shortly. Each morning, we thought she was getting better and each evening, we realized she had actually gotten worse. And so they went into her bedroom. She was there, lifeless and inanimate, thrown across the bed, her head hanging down, and her and her pale and distorted features half covered by her hair. In horror, I beheld the body of Claire, my love, so lately living, so dear, so worthy. I rushed towards her and embraced her with ardour, but the deathly languor and coldness of the limbs told me that what I now had in my arms had ceased to be the Claire whom I had loved and cherished. Alas, what foul curse lit lies in my gentle touch? I have lost my only child to the darkness, my husband to devouring madness, and now my lover has departed this world as well. Is my love truly as poisonous as my ominous name? No, it was your husband. He got a little jealous. The tombstone says Clara Steber. This must be the grave of the wonderful maid I've heard so much about. I can't help but notice that it's been emptied. You know what I'm saying? In any case, I know we can go unfreeze this milk and give it to the cat now, but I want to go out to the greenhouse and see what's the up and up on that. Oh, another journal page, you say? More letters. Can someone tell me what happened to poor Clara? Some time has passed since the demise of Claire. As I calm down and regain control over my emotions, it has occurred to me that there are some mysterious circumstances concerning her death. The sickness that came over her was swift and sudden indeed. Admittedly, my own medical knowledge is limited, but it still seems to me that such an instant and terminal change in a bodily humor should not occur naturally. Could it be that she somehow ingested something that made her sick? But what? And from that line of thought, it is not a far leap to ponder if she was murdered. It was long ago that I lost track of the details of my husband's deranged research, but I do know that he handled sleeves of substances and obscure chemicals. How easy it would have been for him to slip something into Claire's food. So then, why would he do such a thing? Did he know about our affair? We were very careful, but perchance he guessed it, despite our efforts. He would not go so far as murder based solely on a guess, would he? The distressing truth is, I no longer have any way of telling what Wolfram is capable of. It is of vital importance that these notes never reach any eyes but my own. These are grave accusations I am scribbling down, and in ways of proof I do not even have anywhere to start looking, and yet the possibility is there, gloating in its simplicity. Nah, girl, you were right. He guessed it and he crazy. Alright, let's look around here, see what's going on. Apparently, not much. Boxes, okay. Yes, those are indeed boxes. All right, Belladon, or I don't even know. She could be Clara. She could be since her body is missing. Nothing inside. Okay. Belladonna, this little plant has caused a lot of trouble. For a flower, it's not particularly beautiful, but for a murder weapon, it sure is. Ah, oh, so we're taking the Belladonna. It's a large huh? tree. Looks very peaceful. Couldn't I have been reincarnated into one of those instead of being forced back into this mess? I feel you, girl. I feel you. Alright, so I think that's all that's in here. Oh, there's a lantern. This lantern might prove to be the very first thing that actually manages to shed some light on my situation. I'll keep it. 
Oh, and there's another journal page. But, uh, well, I think we have another minute or so. I'm not sure since I had to restart the, the Look, video. A journal page was hiding behind the plant. Did Wolfram murder poor Claire or did he not? My situation has reached a point where it hardly makes any difference. I still cannot prove anything, but my conviction of his sin is only growing stronger. I cannot look at his face without seeing a murderer, nor I listen to his voice without hearing the words of an evil man. And the coward knows it. He sees the judgment in my eyes and he shrieks away from it like the rodent he is. Guilty or not, he cannot act more like a culprit if he so confessed his crime in the town square. He was hiding in his laboratory before, and now he practically lives there. We both realize that he lacks the courage to meet my gaze, and after that he simply stopped coming back upstairs. The villain! The fiend! He can rot away in his dungeon, forgotten by the world. His remaining days spent in darkness and solitude. I will not forgive him. How could I? When he was, when he has provided me with nothing but misery since the day we met. The living areas of this castle are mine now. That my husband is incapable of even confronting me, he shall have no benefit from them. Curse my miserable existence. Okay, so now I'm sure that we have come upon the 15 minute mark and we'll have to end it here. I'm really interested in seeing how this ends though because Belladonna figured it out. And I think she's the one that killed him. And I'm pretty sure that this is actually Clara, the maid, that came back. Because um, one thing that that really st stood out to me was that uh, Belladonna was writing here that she she has to remember. Like, she, she, she must think remember. And one of the things that the guy said was that, you know, oh, it takes her to soul in her wheel. But... Obviously it came back and it didn't work out too good for him, but we'll have to figure out what happens in the next video, hopefully. So if you guys liked the video, comment, subscribe, like, and share this video, get the word out about Michi Gamer. Thank you guys so much for watching and Michi Gamer signing out.